Father God, thank you for blessing us with your presence this morning and for your wisdom in deciphering this information that we're going to cover on your signs um, that you have foretold will usher in the new millennium with your son at the helm. We thank you. We praise you. You are Alpha and Omega. And we ask for your continued blessings of those of us who have fallen ill and who need your support in their recovery. Please restore them to their full recovery and health. We ask for your protection for those who are traveling this week for their safe return to us. And we just love you and praise you. And we ask these things in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Uh, we have one circulating. Um, yeah, uh, by the way, Julie is with extended family for a, uh, a early Thanksgiving, and she's in Austin right now, so uh, we're just going to have to, to wing it <laughs> without her being here. Um, so if I start running uh, tight on time, somebody just point point to the clock or whatever. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this this point that we're discussing, where we're at right now, is uh, full of symbolism. This is probably the most symbolism yeah. we've seen so far, and it's also the most information we have to cover. So I, I hope we we can get through all this, but um, I can understand it if, if we don't. Uh, first, I'm going to start with um, MacArthur's commentary again, because this will kind of explain the phase that we're going into. Uh, we, we're starting with the first uh, in uh, the first scripture in chapter 12. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars, and she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, MacArthur says, the first thing John saw in this vision was a great sign, the first of seven signs in the last half of Revelation. Mega, or great, appears repeatedly in this vision, Everything John saw seemed to be huge, either in size or in significance. Semion, or sign, describes a symbol that points to a reality. The literal semion describes a symbol that points to a reality, and the literal approach to interpreting scripture allows for normal use of symbolic language, but understands that it points to a literal reality. In this case, the language, in the, well, in this case, the description plainly shows that the woman John saw was not an actual woman. Now, when I first read this scripture, the first time I read it, I was thinking of Mary, the mother of Jesus, you know, that this was an actual person, but it's not. So knowing that it's not, but more of a symbol, who do you think this symbolizes? Israel. Israel. It, it, it symbolizes the 12 tribes. Um, so, the reference to the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, Jesus shows that this woman is a symbolic mother. Uh, the woman is the second of four symbolic women identified in Revelation. The first, though an actual woman, had the symbolic name Jezebel. And we read that in chapter 2. She was a false teacher and symbolizes paganism. Another symbolic woman depicted as a harlot appears in, and we're going to get to that in chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. She represents the apostate church. The fourth woman described in 19, 7 through 8 as the bride of the lamb represents the true church. By the way, as we go through this, you're going to uh, also see in this chapter where his commentary about pre-trib rapture is reinforced because of the language and that 
the true church is raptured out before they get to this stage. Thanks be to God. Uh, because I know you all have read this, and I know you all know how bad this is going to be. Um, so going back to the question on the first question on page 75 of our handbook, uh, let's let's go through and try to answer these questions as best we can. How do the media and Hollywood films portray supernatural evil and demonic activity? Is this accurate according to the Bible's view? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Well, what about those horror films like um, Rosemary's Baby or, or that sort of thing? You know, they're they're kind of glorifying the coming of the Antichrist, aren't they? Um, anybody disagree with that, or anybody see anything different with that? Uh, how how is this accurate according to the Bible's view? Well, let me stop and say what I think. When you get to chapters 12 through 14, this is looking at it from the world perspective and not the heavenly perspective. So, you know, I've always wondered, Satan knows the Bible better than we do. How is it that he doesn't realize that he lost, especially after the resurrection of Jesus? You know, it seems to me... Has anybody ever thought about that, that, you know, the, the devil kind of knows what's coming or should know? Any comments on that? I wonder the same thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's like on the runaway train. He can't get off. Yeah. He knows it's going to crash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what does he do? I, I, well, really, that brings up how God uses him as as God's plan. I mean, the devil's being used to what? Basically burn through all the sin here on this on this earth, right? Maybe this doesn't have control. Yeah. Like, I reach for the cookie jar. I know what I'm going to get at, but I do it anyway. Yeah. It's kind of, he's going to do it anyway, but he can't control it. He can't control it. Boy, that's an excellent point because... How did he get in trouble to begin with? He couldn't obey God, could he? He's the ultimate rebel. And he took a third of the angels with him. So just imagine, you know, he... he you know, I've always heard this saying, and it makes sense. Never gamble with anything that you can't afford to lose. And he just gambled it all, didn't he? So... George, yeah. that I think, I know I do, and I, and I think probably other people do too. They think that the devil isn't as powerful as he is. And I think because we think God had, God is the ultimate winner, that we don't treat him as the um, evil force that he is. Right. Well, what did he start out being? The morning star, the, the cherub who covers. He had the premier spot in the cherubim and seraphim. He was, the, he was the ultimate protector of God. And what happened to him? He was the closest at one point, right? So you would think, what, what happened here? I mean, I mean, that does cross my mind. Like, how could you be number one and all of a sudden go to the very bottom as quickly as you did? Yeah, kind of like Jesus and Judas. Yeah, kind of like Jesus knew all along Judas was going to betray him. It's kind of the same action there. Um, okay, so have you ever been in a situation or around a person that seemed to epitomize evil? 